Hey guys, today we're going to be covering auto guiding with a Skyguider Pro or a Star Adventure. This is something that I was trying to research, but honestly, I couldn't really find much information online. So I went out, I bought an auto guider, bought a guide scope, tested it all out. So now I can report to you guys today how well this actually works. I'm going to show you how to set everything up. I'll also show you what I bought. And hopefully by the end of the video, auto guiding will make a lot more sense. And ultimately, this should allow you to take much better and longer exposures with a telephoto lens or even a small telescope. All right, and here's my actual auto guider. So the auto guider itself is just this piece on the back, and that slides into what's called the guide scope. So the auto guider has two ports here. We've got a USB port and an ST4 port. We'll cover those more later, but this port will go in your laptop, this in your star tracker. And as you can see, it's a very small, compact little camera, and it's plugged into almost an equally small guide scope. And then this is what allows you to look up at the stars, just kind of like a, a lens or a small telescope. And then on the bottom, I have a hot shoe adapter. So this will actually slide right onto my camera. And that's how I mount everything. But this is really all you need to get. Again, you've got an auto guider, which is like a very small camera, a little tiny guide scope, and then a way to mount it. And you don't have to go this route, but that's the route I went down. So now that we've taken a look at this, we'll continue on and see how you set it actually up on your camera. Now before I continue, there are different ways you can mount your auto guider to your Sky Guider Pro, or if you have the Star Adventure, that actually makes things a lot easier. But since I do have the Sky Guider Pro, there's really not an easy way to mount it anywhere on the declination bracket. So what I've done is I bought this hot shoe adapter, and all I have to do now is attach it directly to my camera's hot shoe, and then tighten it down. And now once it's nice and tight, it's pretty much gonna follow my lens wherever I point, and that's exactly what we need at night. And this works pretty well. It's not completely tight. As you can see, it moves around, even though it's kinda not as tight as you can get. And that's just because this adapter is one size fits all, and not every hot shoe is quite the same. And uh, basically, it's not perfect, but at the same time, for what we're doing, it works more than well enough. Because even if you can just turn it like that, you can kind of just jam it there. You can even get like a toothpick some way. Uh, but I've never really had any issues with it, even though it does move around a little bit. But I wanted you to be aware of that if you decide to go this route. That's by far the easiest, cheapest, and simplest way to do this. Again, if you have the Star Adventure, I'll include a link in the description. There's a guy out there, he's done a really crazy setup with his. So you have a lot more flexibility if you do have the Star Adventure. But for Sky Guider Pro users, this adapter is the way to go as far as I'm concerned. It's relatively cheap and it works well. So that's all you have to do to mount the auto guider to your camera. And then from here, you would attach the two cables. One would go into the tracker, the other to your laptop. We'll look at that next. But before we get there, I thought we'd talk about which auto guider I bought, which guide scope I bought, and how well they actually work. When I was researching auto guiders, there was quite a few options. The first one that I found was the Orion Magnificent Mini. And this one costs about $350. For me, that seemed kind of steep. I mean, that's almost as much as I paid for the Sky Guider Pro. And without any reliable information online, I wasn't really sure if it was worth paying that much for something that might even not uh, work that well. So with that in mind, I kept doing more research. Eventually, I found ZWO, and they make pretty good cameras for a reasonable price. That's what I have here. This is the ZWO ASI 120mm Mini. And that one cost me around $150. Now, unfortunately, right after I bought it, I was using it on my laptop and I noticed there's some odd compatibility problems, did some more research, and it seems like since this is a USB 2.0 model, it's a little bit older, I guess it does tend to have compatibility issues. Now, uh, after the first few times I use it, it seems to actually work fine. I don't know why it was a hassle to start, but with all that in mind, this is probably the cheapest auto guide you can get that works reasonably well. But I don't necessarily recommend it because like I said, there are compatibility issues with it, especially with newer laptops it seems. And it sounds like there's like a 50% chance if you buy it, it might not work for your computer. So with that in mind, if you wanna get a reasonably priced guide scope, or rather auto guider, I'd recommend the ASI 120 MMS. It's basically the next step up from this. It's the supercharged version, if you will. And that one has USB 3.0, that's the main difference. So with this model, Everything I've read sounds, uh, you just plug it in your laptop and it works, provide you get all the drivers, and I haven't really seen any issues with that one. So now that I've bought what I bought, if I could go back in time, I would buy that ASI 120S and 
it seems like that's one of the best options you can do. It works, it's not too expensive, and overall it's a great little auto guider. Now, of course, that's only half of the gear that you're going to need. Of course, you're going to need a guide scope as well. And what I have mounted here, this is the ZWO 30 millimeter F4 guide scope. And this one cost me about $100. The reason I bought this one, uh, A, it's ZWO. I figured I'd match it with the uh, auto guider. But also, it's very small, as you can see right here. It's very lightweight. It only weighs about a pound. And when we're attaching stuff to the top of our camera, we want something lightweight, obviously. So with all that in mind, that's the guide scope I went with. Again, that's the ZWO 30 millimeter F4. And to be clear, it actually has a 120 millimeter focal length, which if you're a photographer, used to that more. The 30 millimeter is not the focal length, to be clear. Uh, so that's the auto guider and the guide scope that I bought. They both work well together. And it's a very simple, lightweight addition to your camera setup. With that in mind, though, it is going to throw off your counterweight balance when you're doing your balancing at night. So what I've found is that this isn't my normal camera, so this is actually going to balance pretty well. Uh, but point being, if you have your counterweight way down here at the bottom with your current setup, if you add the auto guider, you might need to get a second counterweight now uh, just because it, the fact that it sits so high up and that's one extra pound right around there, it will throw things off. So just keep that in mind. You know, you could maybe put some magnets on the bottom of here, although I don't want magnets around all my camera gear and stuff, but uh, you have a lot of options. You don't necessarily have to buy another counterweight. I know William Optics recently released an extension rod for the Skyguider Pro, so that's one option you can do as well. That looks pretty nice. But uh, anyway, just be aware that this will throw off your counterweight balance a little bit. Moving forward, now that we've covered the auto guider and the guide scope, you also need to have a laptop with you from now on. That's how this whole process works. You're gonna have your laptop right here on site, usually next to the tripod. That way you can control everything and do the actual guiding. But if you're having a laptop running all night, you're probably gonna need a portable battery as well. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. Now, since I spent about six months on the road each year, I ended up going for a pretty nice battery. This is the Jackery 240 watt hour battery. So you can see I've got a way to plug in my laptop now. I've also got some USB ports and uh, a DC port there. So this has everything I need. I can even charge it while I'm driving or if I go to the library. This was a perfect option for me, but it costs about $250. So if you're just getting a, an external battery for auto guiding alone, you don't really have to go out and buy uh, this model for all that money. I know Celestron, I think they've got like a power tank, something like that. So that's what I would recommend. Maybe something cheaper. I won't break the bank. But if you are a traveler like myself and you want a good quality battery, this seems to do the job pretty well. I've used it a few nights now, haven't had any issues. And that's really all there is to it when it comes to extra gear. So next, what I'm gonna do is set everything up and then I'll show you how well this actually works. So here's how my setup normally looks at night. It's pretty uh, basic, you know, you could probably do a lot better, but since I'm tight on space, I can't afford to really cram anything else in. Just to recap, we have our USB cable connected from the auto guider to the laptop. We've got our ST4 cable here from the auto guider to the Star Tracker. It's going to be the same if you've got the Sky Guider Pro or the Star Adventure. Then I've got my portable battery down there and everything's resting on my hard cases that I normally use to carry my camera gear and all that. So this helps keep it off the ground, but it's obviously not comfortable to crouch down there all night. Uh, so maybe you'll get something, if you get like a portable chair or something that might help. Uh, but this is how my setup looks and then really all you have to do is run some software on the laptop that's going to ultimately send commands to your star tracker and it's going to help you uh, have much more precise results when you're shooting with a telephoto lens but this is really all there is to it pretty simple setup all things considered next let's talk about software because that's really what ties everything together so you're going to need two applications to do your guiding I mean, you really only need one, but we're going to cover two today. The first is PHD2. This is ultimately your main application, and this is what's going to control your star tracker ultimately. And to be honest, it's a very simple application. You only have to press like four or five buttons, and right out of the box, it should work really well, so you don't even have to necessarily mess around with it. You just press those buttons, and you're good to go. That's one of the great things about auto guiding is that it's really not hard to do at all, especially after you've practiced even just one night. The other application you're going to want to check out is called SharpCap. And SharpCap is another free application you can get, although we're going to be using it for a very specific reason, 
and that's for a precise polar alignment. So instead of having to crouch down here and break our knees and our back trying to look through the polar scope, we can just use our auto guider and guide scope now to do our polar alignment. And not only will this allow us to be much more precise, like I said, it's a lot easier on your knees and back if you have to like really crouch down to look through there. So that's another great addition to having an auto guider with you. But unfortunately for SharpCap, it's not available for Mac users as far as I know. So you're kind of out of luck there. Maybe you can just give you even a small little Windows notebook or tablet that might be a worthy investment. Uh, just specifically, specifically for auto guiding, it might actually come in handy. Uh, but with all that in mind, we're gonna look at SharpCap first just because this is the app I do first at night, and then we'll look at PhD too. Before we continue on into SharpCap, there's usually three things you wanna do each night. So just like normal, we would set up our star tracker, point it up towards the North Star, but before you add all this extra stuff, the declination bracket, the lens and all that, do your rough polar alignment. So crouch down, look through the polar scope, verify that the North Star is where it needs to be in the reticle by using your app, make your adjustments here on your altitude and your azimuth. Once you've done that, that's gonna help us a lot later on. Then once you've done your precise polar alignment, attach your declination bracket, your weights, your camera. Now we need to rebalance everything, especially if this is your first time with the guide scope, it's gonna throw off the weight. So we're gonna loosen it, log it down. In this case, pretty good balancing, not a problem. And while we're at this, there's other, one other point I need to mention. With this particular adapter on my particular hot shoe, it does flex left and right a little bit. So we are gonna be moving everything in this horizontal position for sharp cap. So with that in mind, really like torque this to the right be, that way it doesn't fall over there later. You'll understand what I'm talking about later on, but uh, point being, just make sure this is angled off to the right. Then you can position everything back. And the last thing we need to do before we go into sharp cap is angle our, ultimately our guide scope to the North Star as close as possible. So I just crouch down behind here. And even if this thing is off center from the lens a little bit, I can use my declination axis here to turn it towards the North Star. So do what you gotta do to get it pointed up as close to the North Star as possible. Lock everything down. And now we're finally ready to go into sharp cap. That's just gonna make everything easier now that we've done these basic adjustments. Once sharp cap is loaded up, we need to select our camera. So you should have already installed your software and drivers and plugged your camera in your laptop. Once you've done that, we'll go up to cameras and then we'll select the camera that we have plugged in. In this case, I'm using the ZWO. Now at this stage, we have access to all of the camera settings over on the right. The only two we're really concerned about though are the exposure listed in seconds or milliseconds. I recommend putting it to two seconds right out of the gate. That'll get you where you need to be. And then the gain down below, put that to like 70 or 80 to start off with. At that point, the stars should be visible, provide you focused your guide scope already. One other thing you wanna do if you're gonna be doing the polar alignment feature, let's go up to file, settings, polar alignment, and you need to put in your exact latitude and longitude here. If you're doing this on a Wi-Fi connection, you can just hit geolocate and it should automatically pull in that information. Uh, but you need to make sure you remember to do that. Otherwise you won't get the most accurate results. Now with all that done, we can go up to tools and then we're going to click on polar align. And this is what's going to allow us to get a really accurate polar alignment. So this is just going to tell you all the different steps you need to take, but really you can just hit next and then I'll bring up our main window. SharpCap is now doing a process called plate solving. In other words, it's looking at the stars that it can see on screen. It's using an internal database and it's figuring out which direction it's pointing based off the distances of the stars. So it's pretty advanced stuff. Uh, you can read everything there on the bottom of the screen. It's really pretty essential stuff, but the main thing we're looking for is that solved in green and towards the lower right. He's got to make sure that SharpCap can detect enough stars to continue on, uh, but provide your point pretty close to the North Star, you should be fine. What I'm doing on screen right now is I'm actually adjusting my azimuth and my altitude screws on the base of my SkyGuider Pro. And my goal is to get the North Celestial Pole and Polaris visible on screen. I only really recommend doing this your first couple of nights so you can get the hang of what's going on. Uh, once you get better with this, you don't really have to do this, but once we get the North Celestial Pole visible on the center of the screen, it'll help to make you aware of what's going on. Uh, so again, I'm just adjusting the altitude and the azimuth screws on my base right now, and we're seeing the adjustments in real time. The reason it's so laggy 
is because my shutter speed on the auto guider is two seconds. So every two seconds it refreshes with a new image. Now this is important here, that AUMI, the big bright star, that's Polaris. And you can see it's pretty close to the North Pole there, the point where all the stars rotate around. So this is giving us a much more accurate uh, polar alignment than we could ever get potentially using just the polar scope built in to our star tracker. Again, you don't have to go through all this work to get the North Celestial Pole centered in the screen with Polaris visible. In fact, the other night I was way off to the right and it still worked really well and I was pretty close on my alignment, but I only recommend doing this like the first few nights to get comfortable. Once you've gotten at least some of those green concentric rings and it says solved, you can click next down there in the lower right. And now it's going to tell you to rotate uh, 90 degrees on your right ascension. So for that, we're going to head back out in the field and then we'll make that adjustment. All right, so SharpCap has asked us to rotate everything 90 degrees. All we have to do is loosen our clutch here, drop it right down there so everything's horizontal now, and lock it down tight. You also want to make sure at this stage, again, that this lens and guide scope hasn't tilted a little bit to the right. And also, make sure your declination axis is locked down, because if it's not, you might see the star is constantly streaking because your lens is actually very slightly rotating. So just make sure everything's locked down nice and tight. Make sure it's in the horizontal position. That's 90 degrees from vertical. Now we can head back to the laptop and go through the rest of the stages. In order to complete the polar alignment process and get to this stage, you will need to purchase the SharpCap Pro license, which is about $15 a year. Just be aware of that. But provided you got the license and everything's working, you should now see that polar align error is around 48 minutes, 10 seconds, and it's rated as poor. So our goal now is to adjust our altitude and azimuth screws on our base and get that number as low as possible. And thankfully, we have a bit of a, a help for us there. It says right and up. So we need to rotate our azimuth adjustment screws to the right very slightly. And we also need to rotate our altitude knob up just a little bit. And this is kind of tricky to do. The first night, it probably took me 30 minutes to get the hang of it. And then last night, it took me less than two minutes and I got it almost perfect. So point being, don't get discouraged your first couple times doing this. The main things you're looking at are the right and up. It might also say left and down, depending on how your alignment is. But all you're gonna do is just make very slight adjustments on your altitude knob or your azimuth adjustment screws one at a time and see if you can get that polar error as low as possible. If you can get it to the point where it says fair, like it does right now, that's usually good enough for what we're doing. But if you want to be even more precise, you can keep making those adjustments until it's down to good. And that's actually what I got it to last night in just under two minutes. So uh, it definitely takes some practice, but really all you're doing is moving your screws very slightly one way or the other until that number is as low as possible. That's really all there is to it. You could alternatively look up at the screen where it has a yellow line going in the crosshair, but that doesn't make nearly as much sense as just reading the numbers down below. Once you've gotten everything looking good in sharp cap, we can rotate our system back to the vertical position. And now we have a very precise polar alignment that's gonna help us get better results when we're shooting at night. So that's step one finished. Now we need to position our camera and lens to the object we wanna photograph for the night, whether that's the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, whatever it is, we're gonna just loosen our right ascension and our declination and then point everything wherever it needs to go. And also you're going to want to zoom in, you're going to want to take your test photos at this point, get everything sharp and focused at whatever focal length you want, just like we would do on a normal night. Then we'll lock down our right ascension, lock down our declination, and just make sure everything's secure. At this point, once we're pointing up to the object, we've got the object centered and focused, and everything looks good, now we can head back to the laptop, start up PhD2, and begin our guiding. Just make sure your cords aren't getting too tangled up because that can cause you issues later on in the night. The first thing we want to do when we get into PhD2 is click the little USB icon in the lower left and then connect our camera and also our star tracker. If you're not sure how to set all this up, there's plenty of YouTube videos online already. I also cover this in my auto guider course, which is now a part of uh, most of my courses over on my website. So you can check that out or just find it on YouTube. It's pretty simple to do. That's step one though, is we connect everything. Step two is we need to begin taking exposures to see the stars here on screen. So we'll go back down the lower left and click the begin looping button. Looks like a green refresh icon. Once you've done that, the stars should become visible on screen. Then 
We can adjust the gamma slider here at the bottom to make the overall image brighter or darker. You might need to do that. And we'll also adjust the shutter speed to three seconds. That's a good starting point. Once you've done that, there's one other thing you have to check. So for this, we'll go down to the brain and we're gonna to go to the algorithms tab because we need to turn off the declination algorithm. Our Star Adventure and Skyguider Pro do not have an automated declination like most telescope mounts. So we have to turn that off and you can do that right from here. Just turn that off. That's really all you have to do. Everything else is good, so we'll just hit okay. The next step is to select a star. So you can either auto select a star and PhD will pick out one that it thinks is good, just like that. Or you can click on a star manually. You might wanna do that. You gotta be careful though, because if you click on one manually, you might see a red sat in the lower right, which just means the star is too bright. So you can try clicking on another star and verify that there's no red sat anymore. In this case, we're looking good. It's really up to you, whatever you wanna do. You can either auto select a star or click on one manually. Either way, once a star is selected, we'll click the begin guiding button down there in the lower left. It looks like the PHD2 icon. At this point, PHD2 is sending commands to your star tracker. It's telling it to move in different directions and it's seeing which way the star moves on screen. And by doing that, it's able to figure out which direction it's pointing and ultimately give you good results. So this stage will take two or three minutes to complete. Once it finishes, those yellow lines should turn green. And now PHE2 is officially guiding and that's really all there is to it. It's now doing its job and we can head back to the camera. Uh, but what you want to do is just check the graph there with the blue and red line. All we care about in this case is the blue line. That's our right ascension. That's the only thing that PhD2 can control on the Skyguider Pro and Star Adventure. And provide you stay between plus or minus four seconds, that should be plenty good. Even if it goes to plus or minus six, that's probably going to be fine. This gets a lot more technical. We don't have time to go into this today, but those are arc seconds. And usually I you know, the blue line should just be flat right around that zero line. That would give you the best possible results. The more up and down you see, the worse your tracking is. Uh, again, this is something I cover in the full auto guider course, but in this case, what it's doing right now is good enough to get like five minutes. It's 600 millimeters. So if you see that, that's a good sign. If you see huge jumps though, that means you've got problems and you'll have to do some adjustments, but usually right out of the gate, it's going to work this good. You really don't have to worry about it. And then you can head right back to your camera and start taking your photos. You have to remember, if you ever change this lens position throughout the night while you're guiding, you're gonna have to essentially restart PHD2 and redo your calibration. Because since our star trackers are kind of dumb compared to the telescope mounts, they don't realize that you're pointing in another position in the sky and that'll throw everything off. So point being, if you've photographed Andromeda, let's say, and you're done, now you're gonna photograph Orion and you reposition everything, Make sure you, the best bet's probably just to close out a PHD2 completely, restart it, and just go from the beginning. Because every time you move this lens around, you have to essentially restart PHD2 with our star trackers. Now that we've talked about how to set up an auto guider, I thought we'd cover how well these things actually work and if it's worth investing in some extra gear. And to be honest, an auto guider works incredibly well. I was really surprised. Normally when I'm shooting with this lens, it's 600 millimeters. I can get maybe 30 seconds with sharp stars. Sometimes I could push it to 45, but anything beyond that, I would start getting star trails pretty quickly. So that was my baseline. It was about 30 to 45 seconds at 600 millimeters. Once I used my auto guider the very first night with really not understanding what I was doing, I was easily able to get three minute long exposures at 600 millimeters. So that's a huge jump right out of the gate. Now, since then, I've shot a couple more nights and last night I was testing this out and I was able to get easily five minute long exposures at 600 millimeters using the auto guider. And as you can see here in these comparison images, without the auto guider, five minutes, you're never gonna get a usable shot, at least with a Sky Guider Pro or Star Adventure in most cases. And that's why we really need an auto guider if you're gonna be shooting anywhere above 200 millimeters because we're so limited by the inaccuracy of our star trackers that it really holds us back. So what I've learned over the past week or two is that an auto guider is gonna take your star tracker and elevate it to a whole nother level. And you might've seen this, especially in relations to the telescope mounts, they all recommend getting an auto guider, but 
Like I said, there's no information about a Skyguider Pro or Star Adventure, and I'm happy to report that it works just as well as you would imagine, and you're going to get great results by using an AutoGuider with your Skyguider Pro or Star Adventure. Finally, I want to touch on the pros and cons of auto guiding to give you an idea if it's actually worth it for you. And the first negative, of course, is the additional cost because you're going to be spending at least $150 most likely on your guide, uh, auto guider, probably $100 or so on your guide scope. You got to get an adapter as well, especially if you're on the Skyguider Pro, that's another $50. Bucks. So you're looking anywhere from $300 to $350, maybe even $400 in most cases to get a full setup here. Then on top of that, you have to think about a battery. I had to buy my external battery to keep my laptop running all night. That's another $250 right there. Again, you don't have to spend that much, but that's a significant investment. You gotta decide, is it worth it for what you're doing? Uh, again, you're gonna be looking at a jump from 30 or 45 seconds to four or five minutes easily using an auto guider. The other problem is that you're gonna have a longer setup time, not by much, to be honest, the still the hardest part of your night is gonna be finding your object and focusing on it. That still takes me the most time just because it's a pain to do with these uh, star trackers and having to look down. That's still gonna take the longest. But in terms of the auto guiding setup, it should only take you 15 minutes at most once you get the hang of it. Again, you're doing that precise polar alignment. That should take you five, 10 minutes. You're doing your guiding. That should take you five, 10 minutes and then you're done for a while anyway. So increased setup time. You also have these wires now. So if you're around some other people, there's definitely a chance somebody can snag this wire and cause everything to come crashing down, which you don't want. Uh, that's something you gotta consider. You'll have all this extra gear out too at nights. So if you're in a dusty environment, more chance of everything getting covered in dust. Uh, those are the main negatives. The benefits though, the first one that I noticed is that instead of having like 100 or 200 even more photos because we were shooting shorter exposures, now you could probably get away with 20 or 30 photos because if each photo is five minutes, you really don't need that many exposures anymore. So right there, that's a huge benefit for me. I know my laptop with my solid state drive, I'm always running out of space. So if I can have a fraction of the photos, that's really gonna help me out at night. It's also going to speed up your processing time and the stacking time because it doesn't have nearly as many photos. So overall, that's a huge benefit. Also, the fact that you can now shoot four or five or six minutes Every single one of your photos is going to have a lot more depth and color and detail to it. And it's also going to remove thermal noise most likely and some weird artifacts that you get by not capturing enough light. So that's a huge benefit there. Uh, but with that in mind, if anything goes wrong in let's say five minutes, let's say somebody bumps the tripod a little bit, there's a gust of wind, uh, the guiding hits a hitch and it screws up, if anything at all goes wrong, in that three or four or five minutes, you've just lost a lot of exposure time. So instead, maybe you can shoot one or two minute long exposures. That way, if something goes wrong, you're not losing uh, nearly as much time just for that one photo. All right, well, that's about all I have for you in today's video. And I think the big takeaway for me is just how well these auto guiders actually work. I mean, all I have to do is plug it in, press a couple buttons in PHD2, and I'm no longer limited to 30 second exposures. I can easily shoot five minutes now, even at 600 millimeters. So it's almost like I got a brand new Star Tracker that performs way better than the Sky Guider Pro ever could. And that's just because we have an auto guider now sending commands here, and it really does open up a whole new world of possibilities and push this thing to a whole new level. So I definitely recommend getting an auto guider if you've got a big telephoto lens. It's really worth the investment based on my experience. And with all that in mind, if you're still new to deep space astrophotography or if you've been having some trouble, you should definitely check out my deep space course, which at this point has over 14 hours of tutorial videos. And the way I've structured this course is that there's 10 main modules, one for each of the objects we're gonna cover. So that includes the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, and the Veil Nebula, a whole lot more. But what we do in each one of those modules is we first figure out where the object is in the night sky. Once you know that, we head out on location, we set everything up properly, we talk about what camera settings to use, and then once you have those images, you're ready to continue on into the full post-processing workflow. And even if you don't have the images yet, or if they don't turn out as well as you would like, I've included my personal TIFF files, so you can actually follow along step by step and still learn the techniques, even if you don't necessarily have the images yet. And really the most important point I would say are those post-processing steps, because you can really take an image a long way if you know how to do some basic edits. So that's something we really focus on in the course. There's also even a two hour long auto guider course as well. So we go through a lot more detail than I could today. 
Uh, there's a troubleshooting module in there. Point being, uh, there's a lot of great tutorials in there. And if you want to check that out, it's all available over on my website. I also have some specific Star Tracker tutorials. So I've got the, Star, uh, the Sky Guider Pro course, for example, that has like over 12 hours of tutorials, completely separate from the Deep Space course. Same thing with the Star Adventure. So if you want to learn even more about astrophotography, head over to my website and check those out. Uh, but if not, I hope you enjoyed the video today and you learned a lot more about auto guiding with your Sky Guider Pro or your Star Adventure.